right. Hi guys, welcome to our EGX digital panel. Um, I'm Sammy McEwen and I'm joined by Natalie Winter and we're going to be discussing freelancing and games, things you should know. Uh, it's just the two of us for now, so it's going to be a bit of a casual back and forth. More of a fireside chat than, yeah. a, than a panel. Oh yeah, exactly, yeah. So I will, I guess I'll ask you questions, Nat, but just feel free to chat about your experience in freelance. I suppose I'll start with, how did you get into freelancing? So I am um, within freelance, within games, I within am games. A, I'm an actor, a voice actor and a director. So I do lots of bits and pieces, all of which are freelance by nature. Hmm. Uh, acting does not tend to be a, a long contract job unless yeah. you get like hired to be on a series hmm. um, or, or something like that. But in terms of voices for games, um, even if you get hired to be in a game where there's a lot of sessions, it's still freelance. It's still like session mm. by session that you're booked. Yeah. Um, it's, it's different if you're a, a main character, I think, but it's still like you're not in a studio all day, every yeah. day for a block period of time necessarily. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So to be a voice actor in games, you basically have to be freelance. You can't have... Because with me, I'm an artist, so I used to be in studio and now I'm freelancer, but for you, it's like completely different. It's quite interesting, actually. We could have different experiences. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think acting in general, like I said, is freelance. But that being said, um, a lot of, I'm sure most mm. of you know, that it's uh, some ridiculous figure like 98% uh, of actors mm. don't earn enough from acting alone wow uh, to so need other jobs as well so a lot of actors will need to have part-time jobs or they have um full-time fixed term mm. jobs um muggle jobs <laughs> other things that aren't necessarily acting to keep them going yeah um but so i like over the years i've done all sorts of things i've um I've done like costume character appearances. I've worked <laughs> in a bar. I've done events catering. Um, like I've done uh, cat sitting, all sorts oh. of bits and pieces. Uh, but in terms of being freelance, freelance, um, I I've been doing I've been fully freelance for about four years now. Mm. So that's not having another job where I have to be there for a certain amount of hours yeah. every week. Yeah. See, for me, I, I've been in the games industry for about uh, about three, three, four years. Uh, I before, well, actually, it's longer because I used to be a community manager. Then I was a QA tester and then <laughs> I broke into the art side of things. But I was in studio for two years and I've been freelance for a year. And for me, it's one of those things where you kind of have to go freelance if you want to work on more interesting projects in a way, because if you're in a studio, it's quite steady, but you're stuck on whatever game they're doing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And also, you either have to be in London or you have to live near the studios. So because I live up north, there's like a lot less. There is a few studios in Leeds, but they don't really want character concept artists at the moment. So I have to freelance to reach out. Uh, yeah, I, I quite like it. I think it can be stressful sometimes being a freelancer because there's the hustle of where's your next paycheck going to come from? Um, yeah. I put out some questions on Twitter, actually, asking people what they wanted to know from us. And a lot of them were just about breaking into the industry. So how mm -hmm. did you, um, similar to you, because I used to be a freelance artist around working at Claire's Accessories. So I do that in the day and I do freelance yeah. art at night time. So how did you get into voice acting? Like, just go off topic of freelancing. but <laughs> yeah, I am. It was just one of those things that I hadn't considered for a very long time. Mm. Even though I, I was an actor, um, I'd known I'd wanted to be an actor since school. Yeah. Um, went to university to do a drama course, um, very different from an acting training course. So then mm. I worked as an actor for a couple of years, but side by side with doing events, catering stuff. Oh, wow. And then I went to drama school to train to be an actor. Because mm. um, like the, the drama university course was very much like, Let's analyze this play tech. The history of theatre. What is theatre? Is this <laughs> walking down the street theatre? Not to pay you for actually acting yeah. at all. Uh, very interesting. I loved it. Um, very pretentious. But um, 
yeah so at at drama school um we started doing voiceover classes and i realized that a i really enjoyed it and b people told me i was good at it oh, so nice. that was a perfect pairing and then i mean i've always played games but it was about that time where i was like oh yeah video games have voiceovers that <laughs> i could fail <laughs> Um, and I've always been more of like the uh, character performance mm. uh, type of actor as well. I, I'm not like your 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 hot girl lead or even like girl. I I am all the, the weird and wonderful characters. That, <laughs> that's my type of thing. So um, voiceover again mm. made sense. Um, so from there, I just. Uh, started working at it really um got myself a, a voice reel and um a, a little home studio setup and a, the, the first one i i had was it was appalling right it was <laughs> a large lounge i had this little stack of shelves that my desk and my computer was on and i had a usb mic which i do not recommend if you're if you are trying to get into voice acting um for any type of voice acting and setting up your own home studio um it's worth doing the research and it's worth investing the money. Yeah. Like 250 to 350 pounds sounds a lot for a microphone if you've never bought one before. Yeah. Trust me when I say that is a, like, it's worth investing Yeah. Uh, for that good sound quality. But more than the, the microphone, it's worth investing in the, in how you treat the space around you. Because mm. again, at that time, I didn't really have any, soundproofing yeah or sound acoustic treatment options available to me either but then over time i built it up and built it up and yeah. i'm very excited to be moving into my new house next week yeah. i don't know when this is going out compared to when we're recording it but uh, for the very first time i'm going to have a dedicated room that i'm going to be able to have as my studio amazing the office that my husband and i share and a corner of it is my studio with blankets kind of stored <laughs> um yeah so it's been a very gradual process kind of buying all the components but in yeah. terms of getting into voice acting to loop back around to the actual question um yeah it's a combination of getting the tools and the equipment after mm -hmm. getting the training yeah um which i would say is always really important even if it's even if you don't go to drama school definitely do vocal training work with a vocal coach do some courses but read up on everything first it's worth investing the money, but do invest wisely. Yeah, I'd say because um, there's a, a million and one coaches and courses out there. So read up on it, see what the people say, see what feels right for you. Um, and then uh, it took me a while to get an agent. Actually, it took me a, yeah. a couple of years to get an agent, but I um, I started doing bits and pieces here and there that I found kind of on on the internet mm. over social media, over different um voiceover um job site platforms and that kind of thing mm. um which again i don't recommend is the best way to get work now but that's with the hindsight of mm. having been a voice actor for nearly seven years we we will get to how you go about finding work actually that is a question Probably. yeah yeah it's really interesting actually because what you're saying rings true for me as well it's you have to invest in the equipment because mm -hmm. actually one thing that people who aren't freelancers don't know is you're responsible for all your own equipment some games companies might send you a laptop but if you're an artist and you need the right kind of tablet they're not going to provide that for you you have to provide that and the same with investing money in um your portfolio like building up your portfolio and courses because my experience at uni was the same as yours it was it wasn't really relevant to getting a job it was i've done courses since sometimes it can be like 600 700 pound but it focuses solely on one aspect of like environment design and then you're like oh my god i actually learned a lot and then it, you get a lot of art pieces from doing that course and then you can um, put them in your portfolio i think actually for art it's almost worth more investing in doing courses like that rather than uni in, mm -hmm. in a way because i found with a lot of uni courses um people need to research who's teaching them because a lot of especially for concept art a lot of the teachers haven't worked in the industry so they don't actually know how it works so you get a lot of portfolios um that all have the same mistakes and it's like character drawings and stuff and it's like 
your job is as a concept artist your job's closer to graphic design it's all about how is the character going to read on screen what do the character artists need um what are limitations if a character is rigged a certain way you can't be putting big fluffy bows here and here because it will clip into the character there's all these technical things you have to bear in mind as well and i don't think you need either i don't know there might be some courses out there but you really have to do some research and read some reviews you know mm. it's it's hard like when you want to break into the industry and it's like how do i go about this and you google it there are so many people trying to sell their like tutorials or their information and it's there's just so much misinformation and i think a lot of people see freelancing as a way to break into the industry and it is but it's also extremely competitive you have to make sure that um like you were saying like it, your voice reel must have sounded a lot more professional than I imagine a lot of people's voice reels do, you know, even with the USB mic or whatnot, <laughs> there must be, you know. Oh, yeah. My very first voice reel, I did not record myself. I oh. absolutely went to a pay? professional uh, reel producer, Yeah, which I would recommend again for first time is I think when you've been doing it a long time and there's like specific clips that you know a potential client will want to hear and you don't have that, then and if you know how to record it and that your equipment is good and you know how to edit it, yeah, then sure. But otherwise, I would recommend going to people who know what mm. they're doing. Yeah, I would recommend for art, if you can... It's difficult if you don't live near London or anywhere like that, but if you can mm. ever get to like a gaming event or portfolio review, do it. Because that is how I broke into the industry, was I kept going to portfolio reviews because I didn't have a blues clue. <laughs> I was like, you just paint characters. And I had an art director who was like, you can paint, but like, this is shit. Like, you need to do this. Oh, I don't know if I can swear. <gasps> Oops. I hope they're not that brutal with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like, I didn't mind. Like, I didn't take it personally. I was like, okay, this guy's like trying to help me. And like, I appreciate that. And he was the one who ended up giving me my first art job. Was okay. Because... Well, you're not that bad then. Yeah. So, because I kept going back and I kept showing like my progression every year. Every time he was at an event, I would go to that event. <laughs> And be like, here's my portfolio now. Can you review me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but... with, with um, with acting and and voice acting, we audition for so much stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, like I think there, there's some statistics of like if you do a hundred auditions and you get callbacks for twenty of them and you land one job, that's a success. Kind <laughs> of um. So every time I do an audition, for me, that is practice, right? That's, yeah. if it's for voiceover, it's practicing uh, reading the copy, it's yeah. practicing uh, tuning in to the client's needs, whether that's for a game or whether it's for a corporate thing, what kind of tone are they after, what variants might I be able to offer them, yeah. uh, what kind of character voice. If it's for a visual thing, it's, if it's for theatre or screen, it's uh, remembering lines, mm. uh, like practicing uh, kind of postures and, and my acting, core acting abilities as well. Um, so we're quite lucky in that as frustrating as it is to audition for so many things and get rejected for so many things, we are, if you're getting auditions, you're getting to practice, yeah. right? You're getting to practice. So is there a similar thing in the art side of things or is it just you're are you just responsible for your own self-practice i'm responsible for my own self-practice but also every single studio wants something different so some jobs um you kind of have to aim your portfolio at a client so for me all of my designs are like historical like medieval knights and things like that or i have like weird cat people because i like D D. um the job i'm doing now is like another like realism job so when i applied for it my I edited my portfolio to like reflect kind of what they wanted I didn't actually have what they were specifically after and it was like kind of a concern but I chatted enough stuff that I got in there but they're a very small dev a huge company um when you send your portfolio if it's not the style they're after or there's one thing they don't like they'll just reject you outright because mm -hmm. co concept art is extremely competitive it's one of the jobs concept artist voice actor they're the things that everyone knows you can have as a game job, right? Yeah. And when I was at Creative Assembly, we opened up an internship for a concept art intern. Over 300 people applied in the first two weeks, you know? And at that level, you don't have time to, because 
you know, the art director was showing us people's portfolios and you don't have time to go through and say to someone, oh, you could improve that or give them feedback. You just have to be like, nope, rejected, nope, rejected, um, you know. Uh, yeah, it's really competitive. You kind of, yeah, you just apply for as much stuff as you can and hopefully you hear back. I yeah. also find, um, I guess we should get into talking about how do you find your work? So for me, I use a mixture of Google Jobs. Google has a great um, job search engine. If you just Google Google Jobs, you'll find it, people out there. <laughs> it might be like jobs at Google and you're like, no, you want the Google search engine. You can put in search criteria. So for concept art, it'd be concept art, visual development, um, art, and then you put in your location. So you can have like Leeds, London or anywhere. And Google will email you job alerts because they crawl pages. So there'll be jobs on there that aren't on LinkedIn or wherever else, you know, Glassdoor. You might find more opportunities that way. Um, also, social media has helped me get work because oh, I'm getting out of breath and talking too quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, um, because I'm I'm a big networker. You know, that's why I'm in Baft Crew. Uh, go to the meetups, meet people, go to events, meet art directors and stuff. Then I chat to them on Twitter. So if someone's after an artist, I might come to mind hopefully or i've seen job postings on twitter and i apply for them and then they can see my personality that's helped um a lot of if a job is very competitive sometimes there's a bit of serendipity or sometimes there has to be a little bit of like nepotism where someone already knows you so they're like oh yes sammy's really nice i've worked with her before yeah look, let's ask sammy first um there is a bit of that but i've only been free like comes in right if you yeah haven't networked with anyone like nepotism is one of those things where yeah it sucks but also yeah. if that's the way the system is rigged then get yourself in there yeah people can't it's the same with acting yeah they can't hire you if they don't know you exist yeah but yeah how do, how do you go about finding work because like with you now you've like been in the industry a lot longer than me i've just been um yeah i've like just been in there for a year my current job i found uh, just through their website i just applied and they were they liked me so i was like oh cool that's the first time that's ever happened <laughs> and i i wish i was a bit more organized with mm. my job hunts it has been a bit sporadic and i mean during uh during corona mm. it's, it's that's a whole different kettle of fish oh, so yeah. i'm gonna talk about like normally regularly <laughs> um it's a it's a mix of things uh like fingers in many pies so i do have an agent for voiceover work mm. and um they deal with a lot of corporate stuff and mm. commercials and they do uh, a lot of the um they're on the books for companies that do a lot of the bigger video games mm. um, so i've been working on uh, a few a uh, few triple a games that i've got kind of through them yeah also kind of because i know side as well yeah um but they were already linked with them so they kind of they go through that route um and then for indie games it's very much about networking yeah uh, and research and getting involved in games jam like games jams oh I yeah think. um a lot of people don't think about voices for games jams and fair mm. enough because you only have a limited amount of time yeah. right so there's only so many things you can implement. However, um, it's been great. The ones that I have taken part in have been great, not only for kind of my own experience and, and keeping going, especially, so I've done a couple of jams during, uh, during lockdown. Um, yeah. And they were really fun to do just as keeping creative, but also to, to meet new people. And yeah. um, I've definitely made a few connections through them yeah. that, might lead to work um haven't yet but might kind of thing yeah. and uh, following up on those connections but um otherwise social media yeah um researching different uh, different games companies whenever i go to egx or other conventions i'll come away with the i mean I'll, I'll be going around and networking and chatting to the game devs about the game and i'll i'll leave the as much as i want to go and play all the big games yeah. I will leave that. I will stick to the indie area because they're that they're the booths where you can talk directly to the devs, directly to the people totally who are, yeah, yeah, who are making games, who make the decisions about whether they might hire you or not. 
um, and I'll chat to them directly, but I'll also come away with a little booklet that has a list of all the games and I'll go through afterwards and be like, right, I talked to them. That's a, that's not a lead. That's not a lead. That one is following up with mm. them. Um, or oh, I didn't see them, right. Research them, uh, yeah. get in contact with them kind of thing. Um, other than that, um, I know some voice actors who do work successfully off, um, voice job websites yeah uh, that is a whole it is quite a taboo thing um because a lot of them are driving the rates down oh okay it, yeah it's quite a, it's quite a big deal um yeah, it awful. can be quite problematic but then uh, and and this is the thing as well for uh particularly indie game devs if you don't know where to find voice actors it sounds like a good place to go yes. uh if you don't know how to find voice actors if you've never hired a voice actor before you don't necessarily know what the going rates are so you think mm. we so you do get a few game jobs that are like oh i don't know uh 50 quid how does that sound and there's always going to be like actors who are new that are like that sounds great not realizing that actually what's happening here is undermining um a lot of uh, the work that everyone else is doing and undermining themselves really yeah. um yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I I don't um, I don't go on job search websites anymore. I tend to do direct marketing, mm. um, where I approach companies myself or through my agent. Yeah. I love it. Actually, I have I have a lovely friend, founder, and she when I was starting out freelancing, she's the one who like she gave me loads of advice about Google mm -hmm. search engine, and then she said a lot of companies. Um, they might be looking for an artist so if you just apply directly they're more likely to hire you than put out like a job ad because they're like oh this person's keen they've come directly to us we like their work it is good to be direct like that but what you're saying about people driving down the rates it's totally the same with art like and some, imagine. sometimes clients do that thing where they're like what's your rate and you're like no what's the budget and they're like no no <laughs> tell me your rate <laughs> it's like oh that's uh, yeah, the age-old <laughs> freelancer issue. You're just having that uh, that standoff, like, how much how much do you get? How, yeah. how much do you pass? No, how much do we get? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think especially when you have your first few jobs, it's very stressful. Um, to figure out your rate, it's quite awkward. Everybody is different. I know with concept art, it can be as low as like 130 pounds a day. It can be 250 pounds a day can be even more than that with me i worked out what i would want to earn in a year there's a calculator online actually that's really good at this it got the same result i did so i was like cool worked out what i would want to earn in a year and how long i'm going to be on that project and basically figured out my time because you don't want to be working minimum wage you don't want to be like okay i'm on this especially when you're new you're desperate to get on any project for the experience but what's going to happen is you're going to feel frazzled and you're going to be upset because you're going to be like well, I've spent 40 hours on this piece and I'm only getting 50 quid but you know but I'm in a game and it's like no it's not worth it they're just they'll yeah. never it's so much harder to negotiate more money once you've gotten in there you know yeah. so I would for new people I would say check a calculator and if you can find other people's rates online Glassdoor also can tell you the going rate as well I don't know how you figure it out I'm pro I don't want to spread misinformation to the no, people. No, it, well it, it's kind of uh it's kind of different for for voice acting in that um so equity is the actors union mm. and they have um rate cards for lots oh. of different types of work now for uh for voice acting it's quite uh outdated yeah. i would say i love equity you do fantastic work i'm sorry Some <laughs> of the um in that a lot of the rates have been based on back in the 80s or the 90s yeah. when uh you know voice actors would go into a studio and if, so for God, this is a whole topic i could get into and it's so complex because different types of work have different rates mm. uh, for different reasons because of the way that things used to work and they're not necessarily um kept up with the internet yeah and the internet has made it possible for so many people to do voiceover from home, which is fantastic. Mm. That saves a lot of money. But it also means that there's also so many more people mm. who can do voiceover. Same, same so with art. Market, yeah. It's been flooded, right? Mm. It's been flooded with creatives, um, which is great. 
in a way because it means that you're more likely to have a more diverse range of creatives yeah um which is what the industry needs absolutely yeah. um but it it does reduce the value of that work unfortunately mm. um so the there's kind of generally accepted rates for various uh, various things that are still sometimes disputed. My agent has a rate card, and then depending on the client, depending on the size of job, we might sway a little bit mm. um, for um, the the big companies that outsource voiceover recording for games like Side, like OM, like Pit Stop they have set rates and it's kind of up to the actors to be like, okay, I'll accept that rate yeah. or no, I won't. Um, but uh, but then for indie games, it's kind of down to the actors to set the rates with the game studios. Yeah. Um, so what I've done in the past is uh, I've gone to an indie game studio and I said, right, this is the industry rate uh, and voice actors work per hour. Mm-hmm not per half day even if you're in the studio for four hours it should be charged per hour mm. there are some studios out there that charge for a four hour slot mm. um i would say a lot of those are underpaid yeah personally yeah. um so uh you've got your hourly rate and i'll tell the indie game devs right this is what the the going industry rate is yeah uh, what is your budget and I'll work with you about that. And usually for indie games, I'll do um, like either a lower base rate or I'll reduce the buyout. Yeah. Uh, a few parts of an actor's fee. And I don't know if it's the same for concept art or art at all. No, it's um, it's quite interesting. So for us, it's the current thing I'm working on now is I get paid per hour and I get paid the industry rate for America, which funnily enough is higher than the UK, but then you have the exchange rate and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. um one thing that you have to new freelancers and stuff you have to keep buying money for tax as well you have to bear in mind that whatever you're charging the government are going to want to take a chunk there is a threshold that you don't have to pay tax unless you earn above that but it's better to save by and then at the end of the year have a little pile of money you can spend than come to the end of the tax year and go oh my god i owe four grand in tax <laughs> but yeah. but yeah with concept art um mm -hmm. asked a lot of a lot of my friends about this one friend only charges per day and goes down to half days i will personally go down to the hour um the current project i'm on they work out how many hours something should take me or i work out with them and then when i finish that piece of work i get paid for it so they might put three things into what they call a contract it's a weird way of working i've never worked this way before um and then if i go over the hours they add that into my next contract so i still get paid but it's a little bit more uh, delayed i guess but i think they do that to keep track because they're a fully remote dev so i think they do that to just keep track of everyone and whatnot um i've been paid before where it's just been by the day so i worked on it was an indie game about it's a metal detecting love game and i was just, it's so cute i was just hard to design the main character and the guy i was i worked out my day rate with the guy and uh, he's absolutely lovely and he was like, yeah, sure. And then I just invoiced him, you know, for the work at the end of the So I was like, three days work. Yep, fine. You know, but stuff like and that. The main thing is, know what the rates should be. Yes. Do the research on what the industry rate should be. But then be flexible in terms of, like, okay, well, I can afford to do this slightly differently or work with the the client to kind of make it work for them because yeah. there are some indie games that just cannot offer the, there's indie games and indie games right there's some indie games mm -hmm. that can't afford anything. there's some indie games that can afford a chunk yeah so um so what i was saying before is that there's two parts to a voice actor's rate one is your uh, your bsf your basic studio fee mm -hmm. that's your hourly fee yeah um, and that can be for for games anything from 200 to 275 pounds an hour oh wow um, touching <laughs> main characters you're probably gonna get main characters in triple a games you're gonna get more if you're a celebrity you're yeah. definitely getting a lot more oh yeah uh, but your average jobbing uh voice actor that's kind of the rough ballpark and then there's a buyout fee as well and the buyout fee gives the 
producers of the game the right to use your voice, your work in that game. Um, and then in commercials and corporate work, it puts a time limit on that. So you are legally allowed to use this work for this amount of time ah. in the for games, obviously, you can't really put a time limit on it. Mm. Yeah, it's done forever. Someone might use that, uh, even if it's a, a game that's not kind of produced on disc anymore, like, people will find ways to rip it. Yeah, you know? they will, yeah. So, um, so buyout fees for games tend to be a flat fee now, or a percentage like a fixed percentage of the studio fee. So like 200% of the studio fee or 500 pounds or mm. something like that. Um, so it's worth knowing as a voice actor that if you're going into something and people are like, I'm going to pay you uh, three, uh, 30 pence per line, but like 30 cents. Cause there's a lot of American indie games that try and do this per line basis and yeah. you've got to figure out okay if i have a lot of lines and i can do it in the right amount of time it comes out the equivalent of me earning a proper studio fee and buyout yes that's worth it mm. but if it's not then it's really worth considering whether that job is being exploitative or they just can't afford the money and at that point it's like well okay what do i get out of it before you take that job on yeah definitely and i think people have to be wary that sometimes if you're an artist uh like we're seeing social media sometimes people will reach out to you and it will seem like a really great opportunity and you'll feel really special because you're like oh my god this board game company reached out to me but actually it's going to work out less than minimum wage another thing that you have to charge for is revisions so if you're getting paid by the hour it's fine you can bill them for the hour you spent doing the revision if someone's paying you per piece or whatever you have to say okay i'll do one revision or i'll do two revisions otherwise some clients might take the mic actually i have a question dealing with that it is um yes <laughs> have you ever been mucked over by a client and how did you handle it so i'm very lucky in that i personally have not and if i um if i ever were to be that's what my agent is there for they so are the ones that have the nasty conversations and then I get to rock up and be like, hi, how's it going? Hello, lovely to meet you. <laughs> um, the, that's why we had the agents to be the the kind of the enforcers. But um, so previously I was with, uh, for, for theatre and screen, I was with uh, what's called a cooperative agency, yeah. which is where all of the actors on the books take it in turn to be the agent. So once or twice a month i would go into the office i would be the agent for the day mm -hmm. and i would do all the paperwork do all the admin do all the, the phone calls do all the submissions to jobs um and there was and there were actually a voiceover company um that i i would never work for but <laughs> cooperative agency you can't be like no i'm not letting you apply for that job <laughs> so there were people who'd worked for this company and they were not a games company they were a corporate company that did corporate voiceover and they were notorious for a underpaying and b mm. paying late um so it was uh, part of my job was to come in and chase these people and we would just call them every day and be like hey you still not paid this mm. by the way um uh, and we go into kind of uh the details of the the invoice that we sent and um now, I, I, I can't think of the resource off the top of my head, but it is in law that if uh, a contract is, if an invoice is over 30 days late being yes. paid, then you can charge interest on that. And if you make sure, this is so important for freelancers, mm -hmm. when you send an invoice to a company, make sure you've got in the fine print at the bottom of the invoice that is within your legal right and you will charge this interest. Yes. Because then if they pay it late, then you have legal grounds to send another invoice afterwards. Once they've finally paid you to be like, great, okay, you've paid me uh, 60 days late. So that's going to be an extra blah, blah. Here's your invoice yeah. for that. If that's late, I'm going to charge you interest on that. <laughs> it's good. Threaten them. Yeah. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard that as well. I've never had to chase anything like that. But I, I can take a deposit up front for my work. Um, yeah with our i don't know if you can do the same thing with voice acting sometimes yes uh if i like previously before i worked with before i had my agent because again they will do all that kind of stuff for me yeah um i've done odd jobs here and there uh where i 
it, it's been say um a, a 500 pound job total and i've yeah. said like right okay i will uh send you a watermark a watermarked version yeah uh, and then until I get the full, th- and when when I get the full version, the full payment, sorry, then you get the unwatermarked version. But a lot of clients don't like that, and it makes them, because it makes them feel like you don't trust them, mm. so it adds a bit of bitterness to it. Um, so there's, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's down to whether you trust the client or not, mm. um, how much you put into your contract, into your invoice, to protect yourself. Um, yeah. I think a lot of voice actors just kind of trust have to trust the client because again if you're not represented by an agent and you're doing all of this yourself you're doing your admin yourself you have to be both the enforcer and the nice cheery polite person it's that hard <laughs> yeah. yeah you've got to get that dichotomy right um but yeah it's, it's doing the research on your legal rights and preparing yes and luckily, we live in the age of Google and the internet, and you can research absolutely everything. You need to know your rights. Also, depending where your client is based, the law will be completely different as well. So with America, it's different to the UK. Yeah, like, but everything, you can Google it, <laughs> you know, if you're if you're concerned. It's like, I wish we could cover more legally freelance stuff, but every single client is different. Every job is different and every area is different. Like my job freelancing is completely different to yours, you know. I was going to ask you, um, how do you cover the gaps in between freelance work? So you kind of touched on that earlier, actually, with your um, your twenty percent aside for tax. Yes. So I have started using Starlink Bank recently, Ooh. which is great. You can set up um, within your account, you can set up little pots Ooh. for money. So when I do my accounts dutifully every month, as I always do. <laughs> I will uh, take, okay, my income and I will split it out. So 40% is my earnings that I pay myself and that goes to the joint account I have Mm. with my husband. And then uh, 20% goes into my tax pot. um, And then I have a bit that goes into my pension, set up a pension. Oh, yes. We should say that to everyone. (laughs) Otherwise, good luck when you're old. (laughs) Like, especially, like, I only set mine up I, I, it was one of my like tickless things of before I'm 30, what will I do? Set up a pension. <laughs> and I wish that I'd done it earlier. Yeah. Um, so if you're, if you're 21, just getting into the industry and you're like, Oh, I'm so young. Set up a pension. <laughs> Not paying into it now. Um, and yes, yeah, so I put a little bit, it doesn't even have to be a lot until you're in a more stable position, but a little bit every month into the pension, a little bit into a general savings pot. Yeah. Um, and then, so, and then I've got a little bit of, right, that's my spending money for next month. Yeah. On the business. Um, but that 20% aside for tax, um, you will not need to use all of that to pay your tax. Yeah. So I, every year, when I, when I pay my tax and I try and do it in April, as soon as they let me, mm. because then... I have this pot of money that I've saved up the previous year that I am then free to spend on my business. <laughs> and that is how like moving into a new house, I now have this little pot of money that I can spend on buying really boring things like a new boom arm for my microphone yeah. and a new desk and, um, and new studio monitors and new foam and that kind of thing. I have that pot of money that I saved up last year. Yeah. But it's also been really useful as a safety net for when there's a global lockdown mm-hmm. and a lot of work stops. <laughs> um, I'm like, I will acknowledge I'm also in the incredibly privileged position to be uh, married to a man with a very stable job. Touching. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and because I've been um, freelance fully for for a while, I qualified for the government self employment scheme grant. Yeah. So, yeah. So I I know so many people who have been devastated mm. by by this. Um, I have lost work because of it. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely in a worse position than I would be had it not happened. Yeah. But. I'm super privileged to have not had to worry about putting food on the table or paying rent. 
yeah. um, which is not something I can say for a, a lot of actors and voice actors. Yes. So, but that being said, the, so the money that I've put aside has helped ease that situation. Yeah, definitely. I know some people who are freelance artists and they have to work a part-time office job or a part-time like coffee shop job those kinds yeah. of stuffs are going what i would say is if you want to make the jump into freelance and you're a bit too scared just save some money up first to, because i'm in the same position as you where i went freelance because i moved across the country that's why i left my studio job and um finding work took quite a while i had to tailor my portfolio to certain clients it took me because all of my work is nda so i might have i've done like two years in a studio but i can't show that to anyone so i had to spend time building my portfolio and luckily uh, I live with my partner and where we live, the rent is really cheap, but not everyone's in that position. There's been before when I started freelancing, I worked at Close Accessories in the day, freelanced at night um, when I started getting freelance clients. And uh, and then I got a studio job, so I was like, goodbye, freelance. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. I think there the should be no shame. And we don't talk about it enough, actually. No. I think there should be no shame in having side hustles because you've got to do what you've got to do to live. Pe people are I down think on it. In the acting world, it's much more commonplace. Like, a yeah. load, most of my friends kind of lost out doubly um, when coronavirus hit because not only did they lose their um, their theatre tours that they were doing or that kind of thing, but they also lost their side job, which was working front of house at a theatre. Yeah. Or working in a cafe. Yeah. So that's been really tricky. But in general pandemics aside mm. like i think there's no shame in in working how you have to work until you're in a position to go fully freelance and that's a nice little milestone for you when you get there yeah. but yeah there should not be shame in it there shouldn't i think we've got we've got like 15 minutes left so i wanted to touch upon i oh know i'm just chatting away um so I was, I was gonna say for me with freelance so i wanted to talk about like studio versus freelance but with you you can't be in a studio um but you should talk about it well i could i could touch on it but then i wanted to talk about the solitary nature of being a freelancer afterwards mm -hmm. so um with the studio uh they cover all your equipment you don't have to pay for anything i had a big old cintiq tablet really good computer now i'm at home i have to use my own stuff if something goes wrong i have to pay for it i have to cover it so I save my money every month just in case there's an emergency, you know, because if my PC's broke, I can't work and then I can't earn money. Um, there's also it's very social being in studio. You have fixed money every month. So you you know that you're having a steady paycheck, right? So even if you go into work and you just can't be bothered and you don't do that much that day, not saying that I do that, but, <laughs> but um, you still get money at the end of the day. When you're a freelancer, the work just needs to get done. Like some companies are different with their freelance but um for me personally it's always like you have to design this character so if i spend a day faffing about I can, i'm not gonna I can't charge a client for that you know that's me faffing about so there's more pressure there's also the having to hustle having to find clients but there's so much freedom in it like i, I can work with clients in america i can work with clients anywhere i can work on a board game or i could work on um indie projects or I've worked on like three different things since I've been freelance, whereas working in a studio, I only worked on two projects over two years, you know, and you, cause you get shoehorned it. They're like, okay, well, we're starting a new thing. So we're just going to move you across. <laughs> you don't really get like a choice. Um, yeah. yeah, I would say if you're trying to get into the industry, I think studio is definitely more cushy and, you know, but freelance is very exciting. And I think now with the pandemic, actually, a lot of places are moving remote anyway so they're going to be taking on more freelancers so maybe now is the time to strike while the iron is hot like have a look i saw that i think it's bossa studios they've gone fully remote now they've just mm. they just went goodbye office you know we don't need you um but yeah but being freelance the pandemic's kind of interesting because everyone else is now living the life that i kind of lived because <laughs> i was like always at home work from home live in the yeah. middle of nowhere they don't talk to anyone and now everyone else is in that boat so i was gonna ask how you handle that kind of um you know being alone all the time <laughs> so you don't go crazy again <laughs> I, i'm super privileged to to be in a situation where i'm living with my husband yeah. right helps and yeah 
Uh, I'm I'm definitely an extroverted introvert. So yeah. whilst I look very bobbly and very like rah, actor, I'm I take my energy from being on my own. I'm the same, actually. Yeah, I need to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like we're not anti-social but we definitely spend a good deal of our spare time at home playing video games either with yeah. each other or in separate rooms playing different games and so not a lot changed at the start of lockdown yeah um i i think the the thing that i've missed is is all of the events that were going to yeah. happen um, and that opportunity to meet new people, um, like on a personal note, I uh, have had like there were, there were three weddings I was going to go to this year, none oh, of which no. um, have been able to happen. They've all been postponed. Yeah. Um, things like that, you know. Um, I on a I, I don't want to take it to a proper bummer level, but my granddad passed away. I couldn't go to his funeral. Like there's oh. been loads of things like that, and that is. Um, Th- those things have affected me more than the day to day. Oh no, I'm not going out. Like I yeah. have a studio set up at home. I can work from home. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think um, I, I've definitely uh, had more. Like again, I'm very lucky to not have any kind of clinical depression or. Or diagnoses like that but um but i've definitely had more low days mm. than we would have otherwise um days where i felt like oh well there's no bloody point is there i just <laughs> sit here and eat a top of ice cream and that's my day um, <laughs> there's definitely <laughs> days where that's happened yeah i think every yeah they've said that like the sales of alcohol have gone up massively during that's lockdown not surprising. <laughs> goodbye life <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, I, for me, before pre-lockdown, I would go to game meetups, there's some yeah. in Leeds, or board game clubs. Most pl- A lot yeah. of places now have board game clubs or online D&D. Play online games with friends if I can. But I'm also very introverted, so I'm quite happy to... I'm very like bubbly and chatty when I'm out, but I'm also happy to just not talk to anyone for like three days. So freelance suits me in that, you know... I think if you're an extremely extroverted person, I think you might struggle with freelance because... You can't always talk to people and you're alone a lot. Um, I've really enjoyed the pandemic because my partner works from home as well. So it's like I have a little office buddy. So I can go bother yeah, him. And we've got like a nice routine as well of like, we've been working our way through Clone Wars at lunch times. And, that, and that's been nice, you know. Um, whereas previously I'd be shuffling about the house on my own all day. I'm the um, same. Like a Victorian ghost. <laughs> Nothing useful, just being like. <laughs> Guess I'll, I sent an email. I've done my work for the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, there's been benefits mm. um, for me, but also uh, yeah, I think the the mental health side of things can be tough. As like, and again, I don't know uh, for artists or other areas of, of games work, but for voice actors, again one of the the biggest things that you have to get used to is the rejection oh Um, total 100 percent. yep and you can't take it personally yeah not even rejection on a you've been told you didn't get this job basis rejection on a oh i really enjoyed that audition that's going to be a really cool gig i wonder if they'll ever oh that's that i I, there's that advert that i auditioned for okay i didn't get it then um or they've just announced that game guess I didn't get it uh you know um so it you've got to learn to deal with not getting stuff yes. and auditioning for something and then throwing it out the window in your head like forget that it happened it's out of um, your hands yeah exactly yeah um but uh but not having if you're in a position where did I start with this with this story I don't remember I got so involved <laughs> <laughs> It was along the lines of uh, mental health and learning to deal with the rejection, the onslaught of it. So yeah, you've got to deal with the rejection, but also mm. in the context of uh, freelance and lockdown and loneliness. Um, mm. 
I think I was trying to wheel around to some wise words about making sure that you're looking after yourself and making yes. sure that you've got some kind of stable, uh, like have a person. Yeah. And if you that- don't, with. yeah, if you don't, um, you can get counseling through the NHS and they do it online now and it's much quicker because, so for me personally, I do have touch of the depression <laughs> and I have generalized anxiety disorder as well. So I did counseling through the NHS during lockdown. It was all typing. And the, the main advice was like, go out for a walk at least 10 minutes a day, which has actually really helped. And it's helped in lockdown as well, because you don't feel like, you know, my house is a prison. <laughs> it sounds like really trite, like blase advice, but seriously, vitamin D deficiency. Is I a had big... that. Yeah, I had to, they had to put me on the strongest course because I was like, why am I so tired? <laughs> yeah, so definitely. Um, yeah, like if you're having a hard time, find someone to talk to. And if there's no one around you can talk to, go to the doctors. <laughs> because being freelance can be really tough. And being in lockdown is even more tough because, you know, we're both really lucky. We don't live on our own. I have friends that live on their own and they've had a horrible time in lockdown because you, you can't go to work and see people. I think a lot of people are now being a bit naughty and going out to the pub and whatnot. Like I haven't. I've just stayed locked inside. But... Yeah, it, it can be really tough, but um, we should wind down because we've got five minutes left. Sorry to, yeah. sorry to clock watch. Um, yeah, but doing. yeah, I would say with freelance, you can find a lot of resources online for uh, sorting out your taxes, things that are exempt. Uh, you can claim back things like your electricity or for me, I just bought like new computer parts. I can claim them that back at the end of the year, um, which which is nice. Same with video games as well. You can say it's re- research. <laughs> And that, even as a voice actor, it's, yes. it's for research. Yeah, or if you go on a little trip, <laughs> go on a day trip, it was for research. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that's one of the fun things about being an actor is you can claim haircuts. Oh, as, can you? you got to keep looking like headshots. Oh, oh that is a, such a good point. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really cool. Do you have any other like advice for people out there in that, like for being a freelancer and or a voice actor? Or just a woman in uh, games? <laughs> as a hormone. As a hormone. As a femoid. <laughs> I, I would say find uh, find your networks. Find your people. Find your groups. Um, and it, even if we can't go to events at the moment, um, try and get in on uh, games industry online networking things and chat to people um things like BAFTA crew has been great for meeting friends um like I don't know if I've personally got work out of it but that's not why I joined I joined to kind of learn more about the games industry and make connections with people in a wide variety of like disciplines within the games industry um but has also you know has made me some really good friends as well yeah so yeah, looking for those networks, finding those networks that will help you as a professional, but also as a person. Yeah. It's been really important. Yeah, I would agree. And don't sell yourself short. Um, it's, yes. They can always say that you're too expensive and then they just don't worry about losing out on the work, you know? So yeah, value yourself and uh, yeah, p- pursue your dreams, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess we'll wrap up here. Thank you so much for joining me today, Nat. Thank and, you, uh, Everyone enjoy the rest of EGX Digital.